I'm driving my kid to my parents' house, so you know what that means. It is time for a Roto Draft report. I was the first player, and I first picked Luris as a little bit of an experiment for myself. I have a cube very similar to Bun in that it is super low curving. Uh, my play group has gone back and forth as to whether or not Luris would be fun or wildly overpowered in such an environment. Based on this Roto Draft experience, I don't know if it's wildly overpowered. But the card definitely has play patterns, and once they get started, they seem very hard to interrupt. I managed to play four matches. I went three and one. I was absolutely humbled by Zach's control deck, which I think was going to be a bad matchup, even if I was a good Magic player. Uh, for my other three matches, I played okay. I really do think it was just a matter of Luris resolving, um, and that basically uh, kind of dictating how the game went from there. Uh, in particular, uh, my match, my first game with Parker was super, super close. The second game was also close. But it was, it really came down to uh, a Luris Dauntless Bodyguard loop, and I mean, it won me the game, but it wasn't like a good win feeling. Uh, yeah, so this was a lot of fun. I'm Definitely not ever keeping the card uh, in my own view. Uh, okay, thanks a lot for putting this together, Andy. Uh, thank you for the incredible dinner, Anthony. And everyone else, thank you for the games and the good company. Bye. What's up, everybody? It's Andy here. Just got off of a madcap weekend of playing tons of magic and not sleeping nearly enough. This week's episode is a very special episode. We got a bunch of guests in the studio, and we're calling it a live episode, which means it is unedited. Normally, the show is pretty carefully produced by me, but this episode is not. So if it's your very first episode, this is not our normal production quality standards, but the vibes are good. Everyone's happy. We're in the studio together, being friends. So just be aware of this is not a typical episode. Also, we always have a cards mentioned page that has a visual spoiler of every card we mentioned in the episode. But because this episode is completely unedited, we don't have that this time around. But if you're trying to follow along, every single card mentioned is going to be from the Bun Magic Cube. So that's linked in the show notes. You can pull it up on Cube Cobra and open that visual spoiler if you want to follow along with card names. Okay, that's it. Enjoy the show. Hugs and kisses. Okay, uh, I think we should just go. Then sound good? Yes. Yeah. Great. Yes. Okay. Then hello and welcome to a very special live episode of Lucky Paper Radio. And when I say live, I mean there's not like an audience or anything. I just mean I'm not going to edit this episode. So you're going to get all the ums and uhs and empty air when we're thinking and misspeaks and over talk. You're getting all of it. You're hearing it in real time, which means, listener, you get to know exactly how stupid I sound all the time. They're not hearing not it in real time. <laughs> They're going to be listening to it later. No, no, it is being recorded. Time. You're hearing it in the same sequence of timings. Is that what that in real we, time means? I don't know. That's how I'm using it. Anyway, I'm Andy. I'm here with my co-host, Anthony. I, look, I'm too tired to call with nicknames for everybody. We got three special guests. We are breaking down our rotisserie draft of the Bud Magic Cube that we've played most of the matches of. Well, some of them. We've played some of the matches of them, and I'm here with special guests. Parkery, who you all know. Hello. Steve from Cubeheads. Hey. Do you prefer to be called Cubeheads, Steve? Steve. Slick Jagger, just Steve? Yeah. You got to get a little closer on that mic, Steve. Slick Jagger on Twitter. There you go. Steve in real life. And then uh, also, Scotty M. Hey, everyone. Scotty Mertz. Scott Mertz from New York. How's it going? Scott Mertz from New York. You sound so you sound so cute on Mike. Oh, <laughs> yes. I'll take your word for it because I'm not going to listen to this. <laughs> <laughs> this is the episode you won't listen to of all the episodes. This will be the first one. Yeah. I can give you a special uh, Scott free edit if that would be helpful. Um, I would prefer that in most <laughs> parts of life. Yeah. Oh, come on, <laughs> come on. Yeah. Be kind to yourself. Uh, be no, kind. I'm rewind. Great. We're all great. All right. Where should we start with this rotisserie draft? This is what everyone's going to hear, the empty air. Where should we start? Where are we going to go? Who was who pack one, pick one, and how did it go? It was Alex. Alex is not here. Okay, moving on to pack two, one, pick two. Well, Alex, Alex picked Luris. Luris, and Alex played three matches yesterday? Yeah. 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 Beat me, beat you, lost to Zach, right? Yeah. That was Alex's entire... Uh, yeah. So, Alex, so far, pretty good record, I would say. Of the three matches Alex played, uh, doing pretty well. What did Were you surprised by any part of that deck? Sure. We were talking a little bit last night, Parker, about... Your, uh, yeah. How Luris did Luris things to you for the first time, maybe ever. It was a Mardu Luris deck. And, um, yeah, normally I'm used to playing like decks with a lot of interaction. Um, but this time Alex had all the interaction and I was playing green, like proactive present threats, not answers. Mm -hmm. 
and um, I just could not get past Alluris with a Dauntless Bodyguard coming back every turn to block two things um, and gain three life on the block. So and you said that was the first time that you really felt the oppressiveness that some people complain about with Luris. That's right. I uh, was battling through the first part of the deck just fine, and then Luris went to hand, and I was like, oh, I can't beat every card in the deck again. What am I going to do? <laughs> like, So I just decked myself with Uro, trying to get through this indestructible Luris. On your own terms. I love to see it. Yeah, I, I did die on my own terms. I'm going to pull up the draft so we can look at it. Yeah, so I will say, actually, Alex did play me. Hearing you. Oh, okay. Uh, so he, and he beat me. Okay. Um, you gotta get closer to that mic, Steve. You gotta got get real a, into it with that mic, baby. I got just recurring dead weight was so good oh, against so good. Uh, against oh. my deck that it was just there was nothing there was nothing I could do once the Luris hit. Um, yeah, pretty much I, everything in your deck dies to dead weight except for like yeah. Ledger Shredder or if you got Fairy Vandal out of range, pretty much, right? Yeah, yeah, and it, yeah, it was brutal. Um, but I was well aware that Luris was a truck, and I was second pick. And if Luris didn't go first, Luris was going to be mine. So it was. Uh, I, I have respect for the pack one pick one Luris for sure. What was your What was your pick? My pick was Ragavan, because you were um, up second, right? Yes, here we I go. Yeah, second. I got the sheet yep. up. This will jog all of our memories yeah. here. So, um, and again, I I divulged after the uh, after the draft, but for this rotisserie. I was actually curious about the Cube Cobra ELO. Um, so I kind of loosely framed my picks based on the ELO of the cards available left in the pool. Um, so for pack one, pick one, the highest ELO of all the cards in the Bun Magic Cube was Ragavan. Um, and I think so that's that totally sense. fair. That, yep. that one makes sense. I think and we'll get to some ELOs maybe that don't make sense, but that one really makes yes, sense. Yes, yes. Um, and some of them that I missed because I was either like doing things when we made picks or whatever, but like... Um, Bone Crusher Giant was one that I let go way too late. Um, but yeah, so Ragavan I was comfortable with, um, and I prefer to play aggro decks, so it was right in the wheelhouse. This is a really interesting strategy, because I actually, you had mentioned, I think, in the chat that you were like, oh, I assume Andy has, like, done a bunch of drafts and, like, made the ELO, like, accurate to this cube or something. I forget what exactly you said. Yeah. And I... I'm not 100% positive how ELO works on Cube Cobra, but I believe it's global to the so, whole site, right? Uh, I'm going to have to just just correct us because people are going to write in. It is ELO, not ELO. It's uh, someone's name, not an acronym. Just just, oh. just, just head off those questions. I, uh, I appreciate this. So the way that it works is... <laughs> Thank you for I'm not sure if you listened to last week's episode, <laughs> yeah. but uh, I made the, the, the critical error, which I will never make ever oh, again, no. which is that in the episode... Ryan and I were trying to remember that phrase. Yeah, and I had Googled it, so I, I like knew it, but the conversation had That's moved funny. on enough that I was like, no, nah, it doesn't matter. But well, so I thought I knew it. And so I inserted a little edit saying, hey, here's what I think Ryan's talking oh, about. Oh, no. And I was wrong. Because <laughs> <laughs> there's another phrase that I don't know. So I essentially like added, not a correction, but like here's other information, but that was wrong, which is just inviting right. everybody to yeah. tell me. I had never heard, I had heard the basketball phrase, play the ball, not the man. And he was referring to the poker phrase, play the man, not your cards, or not your right. hand. Yeah, right. Yeah. Uh, so anyway, thank you to all the dozens and dozens <laughs> of people who corrected me. I have learned so much from that. Yeah. Anyway, so the way that the ELO scores work on Cube Cobra is that it is a scoring system that was invented for chess, uh, basically considering yeah. each player, if you beat somebody with a much higher rank than you, it has a bigger effect uh, on your rank pushing you up than if you beat somebody who has a lower rank than you. Basically, it does the same thing with cards in every pack, if you if a card gets chosen by a human, every it gets draft a, pick is a game of chess. Exactly, yep. and and the card that gets chosen, th that score goes up, and the cards that were passed by that human go down. So it's a reflection of how highly all the human drafters that are doing test drafts on Cube Cobra take the cards from packs. And relevantly, importantly, it's uh, across all cubes. So yeah. you know maybe Guild Globe has a weirdly high rating because it's only in the Turbo Cube and people take it very highly there. Or so maybe it has a very be... low rating despite the fact that it's incredibly good in the Turbo Cube and mm, you know people maybe don't you, know. you'll get it pack pick seven or whatever when you shouldn't. Yeah, yeah so, so it's a it's a it's a measure of something. It's not it's not unuseful, but there is a lot of factors that complicate it. Yeah. So I didn't have all that information and kind of just was like, oh, and Andy's Cube has probably been play tested on Cube Cobra. Potentially more than almost any other cube on there. It's up there. there. Um, I think it's the fourth or fifth most drafted yeah, cube on wow. Cube Cobra. So, cool. so my my theory was like, if there's data that's there, I should just use this ELO data if it's based on this playtest because it's going to be invaluable. It still ended up okay. Um, I but, mean, yeah. I, I don't think it steered you wrong in many places. Yeah. I think it's, I think it actually is really interesting because I had never even looked at the numbers. Like You were like, I'm going by ELO, which you mentioned like four-fifths of the way through the draft, yeah. and I was like, what are... 
let's look at them. <laughs> I, don't know, I, don't, I don't know what those numbers are. How close yeah. are they to reality? And I think, I would say that, like, I think the ELO, ELO, sorry, I saw ELO. your eyes. Yeah. I think the Uh-oh. ELO scores are kind of reflective of what I would expect a pick order to be in, like, the Magic Online Vintage Cube. Right, yeah. Which yeah. I think the places where the ELO score maybe isn't as relevant for the Bun Magic Cube helps highlight how it is different from perhaps a cube that people are used to drafting, which is that really cheap removal is great here. Dead yep. weight is fantastic. Disfigure is really good. All the two mana burn is really good. And those cards are pretty low ranked because everyone's just like, well, it's worse than right. Lightning Bolt, so I'm not taking it. It also yeah. obviously doesn't take into account the, the context of your deck and that there are some cards that you really want highly with other cards that this is just like the overall kind of like pack one, pick one sense. Yep. So anyway, I just want to go back to Alex's deck real quick. Luris deck. So he played four matches then and went three and one we've established. Great job, Alex. Great I wish job. we could. I wish we could have had him on the show because yeah. uh, Alex is great. We'll have him on a future episode at some point. But you know, people with children—they're human mm-hmm. beings. They're responsible for. They got a lot going on in their lives. You, you got a recording of him trolling you to death almost last night, though, right? Uh, yes, I got, I got a lot of that. And also, I asked him to send in a little tournament report for the intro. So, because I'm not making an intro either. It's not edited. I'm not making a fancy intro. But maybe I'll put a little audio clip from Alex at the beginning of this episode because uh, Alex is a charming delight. So, uh, Steve, how did your actual matches go? How many have you played? Terrible. Uh, well, you just you just you. beat me, so I hate I hate hearing that it went terrible. And I then... played five matches. Okay, and I went one and four. Well, you're welcome. Yes. I'm a very generous host, letting you beat me. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> um, I actually, so I think my draft turned out okay. I had a a lot of very strong magic cards, but I was not well versed in playing them. Uh, I think personally, so just a little inside baseball, I. I I think my two biggest areas of improvement... Please get in, closer in, to them, like yeah. Steve. <laughs> <laughs> the, my, my two biggest areas of improvement are keeping hands, like m- d- mulligan decisions. Um, uh, that's like one of the main things. And this deck, I didn't take enough... Uh, yeah, you put this at the third set of monitors on. Yeah. That way you can hear how you sound. There you go. So I didn't... I didn't take enough lands, I think, to do the strategy that I wanted, like to be in three colors in this cube. Um, I will admit, I was surprised when you went into blue. I think I'm not the only one that was like, blue. I was surprised when you went into white. <laughs> it was his, <laughs> his fourth pick. Yeah. Um, so I, uh, but that, that was part of the ELO, right? Like mm-hmm. the giver of runes was so high. And I yeah. was like, and You're I already wrong. had a JIT and a copter. So, you know. Not wrong. Um, but. I struggled with keeping the right hands with the mana that I had. And I honestly think like other than maybe a cheeky sideboard decision that paid off against you, um, it was just getting like, we laughed about it. Because our games we, were really close. Yeah, uh, our games were really close. And all my games were really close. I lost a lot of very close games this weekend, which as a cube designer, fantastic. I love that for me. Yeah. And... Um, <laughs> <laughs> But I think all the games, all the games, I definitely had fun playing, except for losing Dolores, which is losing Dolores. Um, so that was awesome. But I. Uh, but that was not fun. I need to know if it was, it's just not. I mean, it's not fun to get dead weight looped. I guess. Yeah, but I like. I don't know. I, I'm a fan of oppressive magic. So I, I, even that, like, I don't. Okay, I don't good. Then you give up all it. rights to complain. <laughs> yes, I do give up all rights to complain. Um, I definitely think that I should have probably pivoted into black and not blue. In retrospect. Um, I think okay. that there was still. I, I think that junk could have been better for me if I would have moved into it um, with, I think, the same gusto that I moved into blue when I did. But I, I'm still learning the bun magic cube. Like I, I, I you and me both, brother. Yeah, um, <laughs> there is just so much interaction, and it's so low to the ground. I, uh, yeah, it, it's it's a it's a blast, but it's definitely an environment that like takes getting used to for sure. So. The, uh, the third seat here is Evan. Evan is not here to record. Uh, Evan first picked Lightning Bolt into Thoughtseize, into K-Command, and was kind of shaping up to be a very solid black-red deck. And then uh, pick nine came along, what I'm calling Mall Lock Gate. Uh, Evan came in and took my Mall Lock and indicated they were going to be drafting some Jund, perhaps, which is what I intended to be. I started red-green, and I intended to take black cards. And before I could take my first black card, the black-red drafter took a green card, thus boxing me out. And uh, I don't actually know how many games Evan played either. Maybe I should have asked more carefully. But uh, Evan played me. Evan played Parker and Scott. Mm-hmm. And, and Zach. Yeah, Zach played everybody except for... No, I'm sorry. Zach played everybody except for Evan. That was the one match Zach didn't play. Yeah. Uh, which means that Zach might have lost a match. Who knows? Possibly. We'll get to Zach's draft in a second. Uh, this deck was really good, I thought. It was interesting. It was very... 
relatively threat light, I would say. It had relatively few creatures, a lot of removal spells, and uh, three, four planeswalkers. The most planeswalkers of any deck at the table by far. Well, I guess Zach was close behind with also three. Um, and I feel like this is indicative of a way this draft went. Like, there wasn't really a red aggressive deck. And so Steve was playing red, Evan was playing red, I was playing red, Scott was playing red, and we were all playing for some kind of like value like none of us were like hyper aggressive all the really aggressive red cards were just like languishing in sideboards we were all playing some kind of mid-range or tempo or something and yeah this deck was like a, a kind of black red mid-range deck which historically has been very good in this cube and i think still is very good here in this iteration that evan was playing and uh yeah i don't know does anyone have any thoughts about evan's deck i think you characterized it pretty well in in being threat light. It felt a lot like playing the Luris deck, but there was no Luris. So that once you battled through the Lilianas and I don't know the Season Pyromancer yeah. and the Chandra, there was nothing left, and you could pressure a lot better. With Luris, it was like there's more gas in the tank. You can hit the Nos button and you know go go back in the race. Um, Evan and I had really close games that yeah. came down to like. They had Sylvan Library, and we're just getting to draw better cards. And my, my deck was pretty bad against Sylvan Library. I didn't have a way to pressure life totals early, and mm. Evan had a ton of removal. So in a lot of games, he played an early Sylvan Library, and then just Sylvan Library into running removal, and then we were both just top decking, except one of us had a Sylvan Library. You know how that went. But uh, one of our games came down to just Feel of the Dead versus Sylvan Library. And it's like, all right, well, wow. I'm going to generate zombies turn over turn, and you're going to be drawing the best card at the top of your deck at bare minimum every single turn. Who's going to win? Very, very grindy matches. Scott, you grabbed the mic. Uh, just because I'm next up in the order. <laughs> <coughs> well, first up, first up is me. Oh, boy. Talk rough. to us, Andy. It's a rough weekend. Uh, I've played every match except for Anthony. Anthony, you and I have not played. I'm sorry. I was um, the deadbeat of this weekend. I, I mean, it's fine. I didn't expect... We, we can play whenever. That's why I didn't prioritize our match, because... Hmm. You weren't a deadbeat. You were a tofu chef. Yeah, you I, cooked I a beautiful a meal for, like, 20 people, so uh, I think I'd love, that... love to do it. Also, I had some great helpers in the kitchen. Yeah. Uh, you did a great job. I definitely Thank you. Uh, really put my hot dogs on the grill to shame, <laughs> but hot dogs are That's good. That's not true. Your hot dogs were delicious. <laughs> grill master. Hot dogs are very easy to please a bunch of people, you know? Anyway, uh, I first picked Ren and Six into Fable the Mirror Breaker into Green Sun Zenith Wasteland, and I will be totally honest, at this point of the Roto Draft, I was somewhat forcing a lands deck, because I had just added Life from Alone and a couple other like deep land support cards, like Exploration, and I was so confident if I got Red and Six Wasteland that nobody would want Life from Alone. I was like, okay, this is fine. I'll get the most appealing reason to have Wasteland early, and I will just free roll these cards that are really narrow that no one else will want. No Parker, one... were you were you laughing this this hard just like alone sitting at your computer was, when this I was? I was. <laughs> <laughs> I really thought no one was going to want those cards, and we'll get to Parker's deck in a second. Parker took those cards. We'll talk about that in detail. So uh, my draft went sideways in a couple of ways. One, it couldn't end up being Jun like I had planned, so I had to kind of audible into Naya, which I think was still pretty good. And I also didn't get the land pieces I thought for sure were gimmies that I was going to get for free at the end of the draft, basically. So I ended up still a lands-themed deck. I have Field of the Dead. I have Red and Six. I have Elvish Reclaimer. I have Knight of the Reliquary. I have Lotus Cobra. I have Titania. All those cards. Think of how good life from the one would have been with that deck is all I'm saying. would have been really, really good. And basically playing this like mid-range deck that... I was optimistic about it. I mean, I recorded a whole video, which I'm going to put on the YouTube channel. I should say, too, uh, I should have said earlier, there's videos of all the matches I played of this cube that are going to be on the YouTube channel, as well as a breakdown I did of, like, a deck tech of the Roto Draft, my deck, and what my perceived matchups against everybody else were. And something I was saying is, like, this is a Roto Draft. It's face up. I knew what everyone was drafting the entire time. If I get to the end and predict I'm going to have a bad record, then why didn't I draft differently, right? Like, it doesn't make any sense I would get to the end and think... Unless I think I'm, like, a massively worse player than all of you, which I think most of us are within a similar range. I can range. with that. I think most of us are in a similar range of skill. Zach, maybe, you know, mm, a yeah, tier or two above. I would above. say some of us are to different levels of skill. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so I got to the end. I predicted uh, a 5-2 or 4-3 record. I was basically like, I'm going to lose to Zach. I knew it. I was like, this is my off my worst matchup. I don't see a way to win this match unless he gets horribly unlucky. He did not, and he too owed me. I thought my matchups against Parker and Evan were... could go either way. I was like, these are 50-50s. It's going to come down to like the details of how cards are drawn, what happens. But uh, I So I was like, these are 50-50s. I assume I'll lose one of them, right? And so that those were the three matches I was worried about. 
I thought I had good matchups against Scott, Steve, uh, Anthony, and Alex. Alex. And I was proven wrong in many cases. <laughs> As I sit here today, I am 2 4. So my wins are against Scott and Evan, and lost to Parker in super close matches. We played for like an hour and really 10 minutes. Close. Really, really close matches. I still think I lost to a punt. You claim that uh, if I had not punted, I maybe still would have lost, but I think I would have no, gotten if I hadn't punted. I, ju- I just don't think you can ascribe a loss to a single outcome like that. Oh, I mean, I'm sure there were other mistakes along the way, but I missed two points early, and then you survived it too and killed me. That's pretty specific. That's it's pretty, pretty It's pretty specific, Parker. <laughs> two points on turn three means that... Yes, you might have attacked and blocked differently. Everything could change. From, yes, you might have like, attacked and blocked differently. That is that is true. Like stuff would be different if you were about to die. And so, like you yeah. might have won if you'd gotten through those two points, but it wouldn't be because I didn't survive at two. It would be because I played my spells differently and your spells lined up better against that or whatever. It was an obvious punt in hindsight. The stupid sure. punt was that I was looking at my cards in hand. I was like, is there any reason to play any of these cards first main phase or should I just go to combat? And I was like, no, there's no reason to play these cards. And I went to combat and I attacked with my territorial Kavu, which would have been two power bigger if I had played my Shockland <laughs> main phase one because oh, it's yeah. got domain. Yeah. Anyway, mm. uh, that was really close games. And yep. that was a matchup. Like, that matchup went the way I expected it to. Like, it was a 50-50 and you got there. And uh, frankly, you know, I'm in a fragile place, but if you don't gloat, I'll be offended. You should be gloating a little bit when we get to your to your deck tech. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> Uh, my matchup against Evan also went the way I expected. Really, really close games. Like, it was 50-50, and I happened to get there just by luck of the draw. or you know, it was, just, I, it was the exact same as our matchup, but I just got there instead of not getting there. It was, like, very, very similar. Um, I think our matchup went about the way I expected it to, Scott. I was most worried about Murktide Regent, and you did play it in, I think, all of our games, I think, actually. I think all three, yeah. Yeah, and I, was, I said in my, like, YouTube deck tech, I was like, Murktide Regent is my biggest problem here. Because otherwise, you're kind of threat light. I have a lot of removal for yeah. all of your other threats, yeah. but I have very little removal for Murktide Regent, and I have no way to block flyers except for, like, chump block with a couple thopters, which you fork bolted that one game, which is not, yeah. not very nice of you. <laughs> Sorry again. Uh, so I was like, if he plays Murktide Regent, I'm just going to have to race it on the ground. I'm just going to have to be able to remove his blockers and, like, beat it in a race, yeah. which I did once, and then the second time I was able to remove it. Yeah, game one, and then I think game three, it just got in too late, right? If memory serves. Game three, you were you just stumbled on man a little bit. Yeah, yeah like I ran I, out of gas. You kind in of every like way. didn't do anything except for the Murktide region, and then I think I removed it. We'll have to watch the YouTube video and yeah, check. Yeah. But um, but yeah, so that game kind of played out the way I expected. Like the biggest problem was Murktide region, mm-hmm. uh, and I think our matchup was favorable for me just because I had a lot of high toughness creatures. Yeah. Like I had a lot of X threes, and you had a lot of like unholy heats and fork bolts and stuff. Yeah, and so I was like, I think my stuff's gonna be resilient to that removal. And so that kind of played out like I expected. Let's get to matches that played out not like I expected. Uh, Alex on the Luris deck. We went to three games, but he definitely could have beaten me in two. He just missed some stuff on board because he's a much more uh, at peace player. It's not like super worried about getting like the optimal lines all the time. But uh, his deck was way better than mine. I think if I think if we played many matches, it would just beat me every single time. And it wasn't Luris that was the problem. I can deal with Luris. I have Grave Hate. I have plenty of removal for Luris. That was not the problem. The problem was his removal uh, for my stuff and Bitter Blossom. Uh, Ooh, yeah. Bitter Blossom. I've, it's been a while since Bitter Blossom has really been like a huge bomb in this cube. And so I was really excited to see it be a huge bomb again. I just, I couldn't, he played it on turn two and I was like, okay, I'm going to try and race it. And then he had too much removal for me to race it. And like, I'm just staring down four fairies and five fairies and six fairies. And it's like, well, and then how many? Then I died. Okay. Like I conceded six. and all the fairies uh, blinked out of existence. So the other card that really shined in this matchup was I had seven targeted removal spells in my deck. I'm not a like control deck. I don't have enough removal to remove everybody's threats. My plan was have better threats than my opponent and remove the stuff that I can't beat. That was kind of my like, you know, strategy. With seven removal spells, I plan to have like one or two in the early game every game, pretty much, basically. If you do the hypergeometric calculations or whatever. And he just had Kitesail Freebooter, which in two games took my Arc Trail, which was going to two for one him, and then he just took it. And I was like, well, now I have no removal for the Kitesail Freebooter, and I'm just going to die. And then in the second game, the Kitesail Freebooter, this is the Bitter Blossom game, took my Shatter Skull Smashing, which was my second red source for P and Kieran Nalar. Oh, yeah. And also my, you know, removal spell, if I found another red source. 
And that just, I mean, him taking classic, my second red source. getting your land's thought seized. Yeah, exactly. Getting your land's thought seized. Pretty good, it turns out. Uh, so, yeah. But, I mean, those are, like, very specific scenarios that, like, feel like they were bad beats. But I do think, at the end of the day, like, his deck was just way better against me than I gave it credit for. And a lot of it came down to Flyers and, like, his kind of spot interaction. Like, the Kaito Freebooter was a huge nightmare for me. So, uh, that was me misevaluating that deck for sure. Now, Steve, I also had a lot of problems with Flyers in our matchup. Yeah. I think, um, actually, listening to you talk about that, and I'm looking at the draft board, I think instead of going Fractured Identity, if I went there, like, Bitter Blossom and Lingering Souls on that turn... Like that also could have been like I I I, I was sick really, little Mardu deck because I think flyers are really undervalued. Like I, I I think if I did one thing right was like the smuggler's copter closer to the earth. microphone, please, Steve. I'm so sorry. sorry to keep asking you. I'm sorry to keep doing it, and I even have the monitors on. Um, so yeah, I think that the smuggler's copter. I was like, okay, well, this is just going to be insane evasion and card card copter advantage. copter killed me in and, two games. Yeah, but I think. Um, I, I would have liked to go to black, but I, I'm not going to keep lamenting that. Um, our games I do were, think Bitter Blossom and Lingering Souls would be amazing in your deck. Yeah, it would have been I really think good. One of the only risks you have is that you do have cards like Smuggler's Cobbler and Gta. I think the biggest risk your deck runs, from my perspective, it's is just light. not having enough creatures to make those cards bombs. And, and that's and, where I got punished in most of, most of my matches, and why I also would have agreed with... What I'm assuming, because I haven't listened to it yet, but your your analysis I intentionally of didn't our publish match, it yet, so nobody could, you know. I'm assuming it's it. like, hey, I have enough answers. His deck's threat light, and I should be able to deal with this if he doesn't like have the right counter spells at the right time for the threat. That so, was pretty much that was pretty yeah. much my evaluation. I was like, I think all of your threats die to one half of Arc Trail, yep. except for Ledger Shredder, and uh, I do have bigger threats than you. Yeah. Uh, but the thing was, my bigger threats were just watching your <laughs> creatures fly yeah. over them. And it, honestly, it's been a long time. I would not normally say that like flying is super important in the Bun Magic Cube, right? Like in the regular cube, we Flying's often des- we important. often describe it yeah. as like, it's like retail limited. Things like flying are really important. Whereas when you get to the power level of the Bun Magic Cube, I think very often you're like thinking about synergies between cards and like mm-hmm. doing something. Like big card advantage moments. Right. Doing something that's like, I mean, not broken because this is intentionally like a fair cube, but like doing things that are at the like absolute limits yeah. of what can be considered fair at the point that like, well, flying is like such a trivial little keyword. Is that actually going to matter? And it mattered in so many of my matches. Yeah. Ours, not the least of it. I would also say though, one of the things about our matches that was critical. And I think honestly, the only reason that you're the only one win I had, there's a lot of reasons. Your deck was matched up against me well. I couldn't close the gap with anybody else, but because you literally were doing... <laughs> okay, I did 12 you, to myself in my lands. What? Yeah, I wanted to play on curve. Give me a close, break, Steve. You were closing the gap for me by recurring fetches and shocking yourself and just lightning vaulting over Stop and over shocking and over yourself. Again. Stop shocking yourself. <laughs> I will say it did feel so, pretty bad when I sixed myself to yeah. fetch shock twice in one turn to play Fable the Mirror Breaker and you just remanded it. I was like, that was a cool lava axe you just cast. <laughs> that was a cool lava axe draw card you just cast. I don't think I'll ever cast a better remand in my life. Um, <laughs> but I think I, I, I think um, I was very proud of, of, of sideboarding in the Thalia in our matchup, even though it's a no-brainer. But it, it did it did Thalia on turn three making all your stuff come in tapped. Big Thalia, yeah, big Thalia, yeah. The little Thalia, little There's Thalia. So many Thalias now. Medium Thalia, three mana Medium Thalia, Thalia, no frog. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Medium Thalia, no frog. No mount. Like, yeah. Um, I think that playing that on turn three and and that sticking was uh was the nail on the coffin. They just let my annoying little flyers finish it. I think you played it a lot later. I think it was Is like it? turn six, but it oh, still thought, mattered okay. because yeah. I couldn't get an untapped white source because my fetch land came in tapped. And then the fetch land was avoided foothills, which had three white sources that could fetch. But guess what? None of them are basics, so that also comes in tapped. Who designed this cube? <laughs> <laughs> Great question. I'm just getting max punished here. Yeah. So yeah, I mean, I think uh, I in the long run, I think our matchup is certainly closer than I thought. I don't know if who's favored in the long run. I think also like you had no mana problems in our game, and I do think that yeah. your mana is a little shaky. Very shaky. Like it's definitely like possible no, that you yeah. can just be like, I can't cast my spells and. Mm-hmm. Ironically, I was the one that couldn't cast my spells in the third turn of the, in the third game of our, our match. Um, so I don't know how it matches up long run, but I definitely underestimated the problem of just a bunch of flyers that I couldn't ignore and couldn't race. So another place in which I was wrong. Um, Zach's playing blue white control, and Zach absolutely owned me, and I think owned every other person he played. Did anybody have close games against Zach? I think I he, had close games. I got one said, game. He, he said he was your. You were his biggest concern. You, mm-hmm. He thought you were going to lose to you, and he eventually got there. How did that match play out? I didn't see it. 
it was a good match. Uh, I mean, I got one game. I, I'm so I'm just playing like a pretty proactive mono white deck, and the the lands really played well. Having a bunch of creature lands was very relevant uh, against all the interaction that he had. Um, but yeah, I mean, he just sideboarded in a ton of wraths, and eventually was just able to. He can play up to five board wipes if you include yeah. engineer explosives, which was which against your deck you definitely should very relevant. So yeah, close matches, but difficult post board. Yeah. Um, I, it's not much to say I also cited out a lot of my single target removal, and then he had cited in like a big dragon, which <laughs> <laughs> I was like, "Well, that's Rude. kind of a bummer." <laughs> Rude, TBH. Yeah, I mean, uh, it's not a whole lot to say here. Zach is the best player in this group. I think I can confidently. I actually don't know how good of a player Evan is. I shouldn't say that. Uh, uh, Zach, I think is. I mean, Evan yesterday was like, "Yeah, I'm not used to playing this kind of magic at his power level." So I think Zach is the most experienced and the best player. And on top of that. Nobody else was playing anything that really resembles control. Yeah, we were just for a data point. His his current record this year against LSV is two zero. We were just talking about that this morning. Oh, good. His uh, <laughs> current record against me this year is I think five zero. So great, great. <laughs> <laughs> no, wait. I took here's the thing. I took one match that he this uh, in February. I took a match off of him or a game, not even a match, a game in a match, and uh, he told me this weekend he was like, "It's because you wouldn't let me take something back." I'm like, "What are you talking about?" And there was some interaction where, like, he attacked and, like... You're a real stickler. And I had some, like, onboard trick, and he and I, like, did the thing, and he was like, oh, I wouldn't have done that if I had known. And I, he didn't ask to take it back. If he had said, can I take it back, I would have said yes. I thought he was holding himself to a high standard as a spiky player. Whatever. Uh, anyway, Zach crushed me, and as the only control player at the table, I think has very close to, like, the perfect control deck. Uh, as I, the cube designer, would draw it up. I'd probably like have three or four cards different if it were me, but again, Zach's a better player than me, so maybe he's more right than I am, but very close to like the perfect control deck, uh, everything you could possibly want. So I did not expect to win that match, and I didn't. And then Scott. Yeah. So we talked a little bit about our match already. Yeah. Uh, let's get into your draft. Well, actually, let's get into your draft, and then when we get into Parker's draft, he can gloat about our match more. Yeah. Um, yeah. Since Theo wasn't in the uh, the pod this time, I yep. felt like uh, after everyone's picks, despite Zach taking Snapcaster Mage, I was going to go Merktide, and I was going to be all in on it. Um, the way the Roto worked out, I had a pretty close sequence of two picks in a row, so I was just going to plant my flag from the beginning, commit to the bit. I took Expressive Iteration next, and I was <clears throat> fully on fully on the path of playing what is, in essence, like, Legacy Delver. Yeah. Um, I think there were some interesting picks early on. Like, I prioritized Faithless Looting super early because I was I was, was excited to, to see that as the cube designer. Yeah. Uh, for me, I'm just, like, looking for premium things. I, what I was most surprised about is, like, Thought Scour and um, Mental Note not being touched because they're just instant speed cantrips that actually say draw a card, where some of the other ones got picked up that, did not work that way, you know, triggering things like Fairy Vandal, all these other cards. Um, yeah, it's a pretty standard thing. I think the main moment that stood out in the draft for me was when I pivoted into black and made it more of a Grixis deck, uh, which, comically enough, is the exact deck <laughs> that I did last time we rotoed, but it had an Urza Saga package. Your deck was pretty different last time, I feel like. It yeah. was also Grixis, but a lot of different spells. Yeah, I had, like... Um, Retrofitter Foundry, Urza Saga, Third Path Iconoclast was very much leaning into the that's, artifacts that's energies. The dream. It it was more of a nightmare, but uh, <laughs> as someone who went 07 last time, this oh, felt no. a lot more refreshing. Uh, my my record I was estimating uh, was three four, and then I was told to be more optimistic, so I said four three. Um, I think I actually would have got to either of the two if I'd been able to play out all my matches. My record at the end was two and three. Mm -hmm. um, every single match, except for one of the ones in which I won, was all three games. Every every game was a nail biter, um, and every matchup. Uh, it was really interesting because Zach, I was most nervous about just him and I talking about our decks against one another. Azorius versus Agrixis, sort of like Turbo Delver. To your point, I'm pretty threat light, so. Mm -hmm. And he's pretty removal dense. Yeah, Source to Plowshares is actually Wrath of God against me, um, <laughs> which pretty pretty brutal. Um, especially since my sideboard included a Death Shadow package that I did side in a couple times. Um, didn't even cast it once, but I sure as hell did the shocking myself to death part. Um, <laughs> well, you gotta do it just in case you draw it. Yeah, I mean, I'd ra I'd rather be <laughs> right <laughs> right for trying um, or wrong and dead. Um, yeah, it was um, really close against Zach. Game two, uh, I cast what may be the spiciest unholy heat of all time, where um, there was a, 
it was like it was on my own Blood Sky Berserker, um, which was I thought it was a Sprite Dragon. It was, it was a Blood Sky Berserker on my Blood Sky Berserker to trigger the the second spell to help oh, it, it Blood Sky Berserker, to help yeah. it make it um, to give it menace and make it twice yeah. as big. Yeah, it was. Um, he had open mana. It was. It was a foolish play, but uh, fortune I mean, favors the bold. Even if he counters it, I guess a removal spell kind of kind of wrecks you there. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I I was ready to eat my two for one, but I got there. That was the only game I won against him, so I was really glad that my foolish choice ended up being Galaxy Brain. It was correct. Yeah, I should say too. Like my games were also really close, even against Zach, who I think is a very favorite in the matchup against me, and who won two games pretty handily. Yeah, they were still pretty close games like he had to use every piece of removal like every resource at his at his disposal in order to get there he was at really low life totals he won one of the games by having the last counter spell when he was at two and i went to arc trail in for lethal and he was like counter spell and then i lost to the celestial colonnade attacking the next turn so like the games were close yeah i didn't feel like i could have won but it was like he had to work really hard for it it wasn't like it was a free free roll for him yeah i think that was similar for all my matches every match was super earned um Anthony was my next match for the the weekend, and he was kind of the the deck that I was also most worried about because mono white aggro versus a deck with all of six six to seven creatures in it um, can definitely go not my way. And I got cut on any wraths or board wipes, and my removal is very conditional, uh, non artifact, non black. Uh, obviously, there's no black creatures in Anthony's deck, but they all called for stats or life loss, which were two mm-hmm. things that were going to be challenging at like axes to hit Anthony's creatures on. Right. Um, but fortunately I was able to get like turn two Tassiger, I think every single game of our match. Yeah. A, a turn two, four, five is difficult for me. Yeah. I mean, I felt really pretty reasonable about that matchup because I did have a fair amount of uh, interaction for your small number of threats. But I mean, specifically Prismari command was really difficult because a yeah. lot of my threats were artifacts. So you could, it was just a two for one every time. Um, Prismari command, but K command instead. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, that's what it felt like. <laughs> Yeah. Um, how was um how was Fairy Mastermind for you? I want to know. I haven't seen that card played a whole bunch yet. I don't have a good sense of how it plays here. I I think kind of to the <clears> point <throat> of flyers importance in the in the format or this particular roto, it really it was just great to have the opportunity to hold up removal, hold up an answer, hold up a cantrip and just based on the context of how the turn played out, just flash out a 2-1. Mm-hmm. I didn't get to play a lot. I think like if Steve and I had played, I'd definitely be triggering like the the second card draw um mm-hmm, mm-hmm. feature of it which is a shame that I, I think i only got to once and it was against evans i really wanted to come in against evans sylvan library but that didn't happen oh, that'd be so cool. sweet. it would it would have been spicy i but. did discover that sylvan library is a may you could just choose not to do it because i was wondering really? mm. i think if you i think if you choose to do it which you obviously wouldn't against like a leovold you only draw one but you still have to put two back on right. top yeah, that's <laughs> true. which is pretty devastating uh or is that true? Does it make sense? That makes sense, but I didn't yeah. realize it was you a pay May. Four think... life if you want to keep it. Yeah, I'm not, I checked the exact wording on it. Either way, it is a May. It says you may draw up to two additional cards during your draw step, so you can just huh. choose not to if you want. Yeah. Oh, I didn't mention that. Sylvan Library was a huge problem for me as well. I think I kind of mentioned that briefly in, yeah. in my matchup yeah. against Evan, but uh, another card that I know is good. It's been in the cube for a long time. I like it. It's not going anywhere, but I have not seen anybody be like, wow, Sylvan Library is great in the past couple years and i was like wow someone library is great <laughs> yeah. card's really good um i think other than that did you have fun scott i did yeah i i'm a very did, anxious did you, magic player uh self-deprecating as well but i had a good time i think for me this was like a really rewarding roto draft because i learned a lot um the weekend in general i just kind of focused a lot more on drafts uh in general um but the roto was a great experience because i made good pivots um I played well. I made a couple of It's got to be rewarding to draft a similar kind of deck that you drafted last time and have a lot more success with it. Yeah, and I, I think if I got to play at the rest of my matches, I would have been really... I, I would have liked to see what the record came out as, but all things considered, I'm, leaving, I'm going back to New York a happy boy. That's all I care about. That's all I care about. Okay, it's time for Parker's Gloating Corner. Parker, how'd your draft go? Um, it went well. I was the second to last pick, mm-hmm. and I observed that three people were in red, before me two people were in blue and alex was in luris and nobody was in green except for I was you in green hold you on a second green. This, this is exactly what this is how the problem happened no one was in green just totally <laughs> blind to whatever andy's drafting it's fine go ahead and so i picked death right shaman to start i thought so in my seat i think the correct pick for me after 
Luris, Ragavan, Lightning Bolt went for the first few picks. I think the correct pick is Uro. Yeah. I've played Uro in the last two Roto drafts of this cube, and I was like, I just don't want to do it again. I've yeah. played enough Uro. So I was between Death Rite Shaman or Ren and Six, and I wanted both. But mm-hmm. I thought I could wield the Death Rite Shaman. I think you're the only other person in this pot of eight that would value it as highly as me. And yeah. you took it first. And I was like, ah, blast. It's a one mana planeswalker. It's now, really good. I might not be smart enough to play well with it. And in fact, there were a couple of punts in the game that we had. In the games that we had, I could have been exiling things with your Ren 6 triggers on the stack more often, I think. Or I also punted against gaining your life. own Death Rite Shaman because yeah. I... There's a lot of that. It, it slipped my mind that... I didn't slip my mind. I just I didn't... You, you forget things. Yeah. I, it, I forgot that I can respond... That the exiling the card is part of the resolution of Death Rite Shaman's ability, mm-hmm. not the cost. Because I, you could have like targeted a land with Death Rite Shaman, and you I could have, have exiled it with Scavenging Use to yeah. keep you from getting the mana. It's and one I of the just, weirder Magic cards. It is, really it is very weird. Look, that there's just like some unique stuff going on there. Yeah. Um. Yeah. So I started with Death Rite, and then I let Anthony pick a couple cards because Anthony was eight. Very generous of you. Yes. And then I picked Duro, and at that point, I was planning to be. Like big game, Sultai mid range, the rock kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Um, because I think there are roughly like three non control cards in the cube that vote for big games. One of them is Uro, the other is Field of the Dead, and maybe Nissa, despite what you've said on previous Hot episodes. Take. Yeah. I said she doesn't make the game bigger, not um, that she doesn't vote for a big game. Now, and I think Uro is the best of them. Yeah, there's no question there. And at I that think. point, I was like, okay, I'm going to be the only one who wants Field of the Dead once I pick up so much extra stuff. I don't know why you thought that. I don't know either. <laughs> well, okay, here's why. Because Ren and Six... Like, yeah. Clearly, you were both ignoring what each other were doing until I you made ag- each other angry. <laughs> until, like, it was just like, we'll just let this go. And then, oh, boom. <laughs> like, yeah, I don't know. I just... <laughs> yeah, maybe I didn't see it. But... um. Anyways, I, I, I had, was... I think two ways to tutor lanes before I took Field of the Dead. Yeah, and I wanted those two ways to tutor lanes. <laughs> 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 but, okay, that didn't quite work out as planned. Real not quick, only... I think Steve's got to bounce. Steve, thanks for hanging out. Say goodbye on the microphone. Yeah, We're oh. not going to pretend that you just disappear into the ether. I could disappear. Thank you guys so much. This weekend was amazing. Yeah. This has been a privilege. Thanks for hanging out. Um, thanks for drafting. Yeah. No, it, it's it's... You guys rock. I don't want to. I don't want to gas you up too much on, on your hey, own show. It's but. great to have you here. But next time you're uh, back, you can in gas me up. You can just we'll, beat uh, me. It's fine. You're allowed to beat me and then gas yeah, me up. That's <laughs> I'll allow we'll it. Do it again. You guys rock. You're the best. Some of the best stewards of the cube community. Aww. And uh, it's a privilege to be invited here. So thank you. Yeah, of course. Thanks for coming, Steve. Uh, enjoy your rest of the time at this yeah. con- at the conference, convention. I always say conference instead of convention. Yeah. They're both cons. Whatever. So anyway, I'm you thought see what, you thought what, you were gonna get feel of it did weird Ooh. comedy bang bang character he returns as. <laughs> Huh? What? what? <laughs> Never mind. Um, I don't get it. I listen to so much comedy, bang bang, and I don't get you, it. You know how the guests leave? Oh, okay, yeah, sure. Uh-huh. I see. The whole gimmick of Steve's the Steve's got to go, and then he comes back and he's like, "Hello, hey, guys, it's, it's me, Shimmy." <laughs> gotta, gotta go. go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, um, Parker. You, th- you thought you'd get feel the dead. You didn't. Yeah. So we're on my draft. How how it didn't go as planned. Um, then. I think the next thing that happened is that Evan got into green black. Yeah, you also were affected by Moloch Gate. I was affected by Moloch Gate. Um, Not because you were going to play red cards per se, but because that's right. now Evan's interested in black cards and specifically green black cards. Yeah, so I, exactly what happened is that Evan picked Moloch and had already been in red black. And so now yeah. I'm looking at my Grist, my yeah. Grim Flayer, yeah. my um, Witherbloom Command. Witherbloom Command. Very underrated card, in my opinion. As somebody who had his Ren and Six killed by Witherbloom Command twice this weekend. And Abrupt Decay. That was the other one. That card's so good. Um, I wanted Abrupt Decay so bad. That was one of the reasons for me to be Jund, in my opinion. Right. And and so knowing that green black was on the table for Evan, in my next picks, I go Verdant Catacombs, locking in uh, another. It was like one of the last fetch lands available, and Grist, because mm-hmm. um, I was trying to carve out that lane, but Evan didn't take the hint and still <laughs> took my Grim Flare and my Witherbloom Command. Um, so I was like, oh man, it's going to be really hard to be as proactive as I want to be. Mm-hmm. So maybe. You know, Field of the Dead isn't hasn't worked out. Um, like 
multicolor rock deck is not working out. So maybe I just be multicolor greed a little bit. And mm-hmm. that's when I pivoted into Life from the Loam um, to some extent. Be- because. Boo. The yeah. Life from the Loam, no one else. You're both sitting here just like, no one's going to want these cards. No one at all. Well, okay, that was a really weird quirk of this draft is that Andy and I were the only two people in green and green cards Until went... Evan came in, but then Evan was only kind of more of splashing the green for gold cards That's than anything. That's right, yeah. Um, and so it felt like we had our picks. Like, I didn't... Yeah, I mean, honestly, at the end of the day, I can, you know, fake get mad at Evan all I want, but it was absolutely correct for Evan moving to moving into green. Open. We were the only two green drafters, and if you look at the last two rows of this draft, it's just all the green cards that were left over because yeah. there were so much, so many options for everybody that was playing green, which was just the three of us. Yeah, so... Um, yeah, at, at some point I felt like I needed a backup plan. Life from the Loam seemed like a good pick. Um, I had a Boseju, I had an Urza Saga, and I feel like one of the rate limiters in this cube, or like choke points is maybe a better word, um, is interaction for the Umazawa's Jites, the Renin Six, the, um, actually the Field of the Dead. And so that's why I picked Boseju who endures. Uh, it was like... Besides, now, that was decay, one that I wanted, but I also thought you might take. So yeah. I was not like shocked when you took that. You Bes- took it before right. you took Life from Alone, mm-hmm. uh, but I was like hoping I would get it a little late, you know, right? For my random six. But I, I guess I'm saying, besides Abrupt Decay, I had no way to interact with Gta with all these other non-creature permanents, which was something that Zach made a point to note as the control player mm-hmm. as his primary concern, right? And I do intentionally include a lot of removal for that stuff. Like, the blue eye control deck has access to Prismatic Ending, Portable Hole, March of Otherworldly Light, and some other stuff I can't think of off the top of my head, some bounce spells and things like that. Um, so I do intend to include a lot of that kind of removal for those non-creature permanents that are tr- that are problematic. Yeah. Um, but even so, it's less abundant. And yeah. therefore, I prioritized it highly, and I wanted a way to get it back. Um, also, because I was really wanting to tune my deck for the match that i knew would be recorded um <laughs> which is the one that we played and you had a I'm wasteland shaking lock my head. this is the sound available. of me shaking my head and so i was like trying to intentionally um beat a wasteland lock one thing i'm actually encouraged by sorry to yeah it's okay judd in here i didn't manage to successfully wasteland lock anybody which i think is actually great because <laughs> i love the card wasteland but even i will fully admit it doesn't really fit in my cube with my cube design goals it could be spontaneously very punishing for reasons that you are not it's not correct to play around right i just love the card too much and i, I can't bring myself to cut it and one of my concerns about it is that it will be specifically messed up with ren and six or life from alone where you just loop it and i had a couple times where like i could have looped it but it was definitely wrong to and more times where i could remove a couple non-basics my opponent had plenty of basics they could still execute their strategy so I was actually encouraged by the fact that like I was not able to do totally degenerate things with uh, with Rain and Six and yeah. Wasteland. Yeah, it's it's good. Um, so okay, when I picked Life from the Loam, I was then thinking, oh, I want to do Exploration, Courser of Crucifix, Augur of Autumn, Autumn, Sensei's Divining Top, and just like play a zillion lands, max value. Uh, yeah, and that will help me cast. Thalia and the Gitrog monster and Uro in the same deck or whatever. I don't know. I was thinking big. Um, And that's more or less how it shaped out, except I got some of those pieces taken from me. And so I was like a little bit the rock, a little bit multicolor greed. Um, My matches played out where I tended to win if I could present threats effectively. Like, Mm -hmm. in other words... Nissa Who Shakes the World was, I think, the best five mana thing in the cube, roughly. Um, yeah. Especially it, accelerated by a mana dork or two. Yeah, I think it definitely. I intentionally have like a range of. I think Titania in a lot right. of boards is better than Nissa. That's right. And that Titania yeah. will just say, like, you're dead next turn. Unless I lost you like Titania. answer it right now. Yeah. Uh, it's way more explosive, but it's also way more fragile uh, right. compared to Nissa, who I think is like more kind of mid-rangey guaranteed value. It's really hard to remove all the value Nissa generates mm-hmm. with a card or two, whereas you can with Titania. Yeah, and so I had Nissa, Seekus Chariot, Tarmogoyf, Grist, uh, Uro, and when I could accelerate into those, um, I felt pretty good, and I ended up with a 4-2 record. I lost to Alex, as we already talked about, and... Um, I lost to Zach, who really only had to answer Grist and Nissa because everything else to dies win. to a board wipe. Yeah, right. 
Um, so I, I felt pretty good about the games. Um, and actually the thing that I'm most happy about is that I identified a deck I would enjoy and be good at playing seven matches with. That's a very key skill. Yeah. Especially key, and I think a, a big improvement from the last road draft that I was seeing with you. Yeah, that's that's correct. Um, <laughs> and I'm glad I went through it so that I could learn very viscerally, don't draft a roto deck mm-hmm. that you won't enjoy piloting seven matches with. I can I can pilot three matches with almost any deck and have a good time, but uh, seven is a different animal. I have some questions for you. Honest assessments. Okay. How good was Uro in your deck? Is it a good Uro deck? Um, it was a pretty good Uro deck. Yeah. I dredged it once with Life from the Loam. Mm-hmm. That was really gross. I really hope that becomes a thing. I, I want that to be a thing people use Life from the Loam for. Yeah. I um, had turned two Uros in a couple of games. Just um, the front half of Uro. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Not the escaped version. Right. And I had a couple games where I played Uro twice from my graveyard um, and didn't lose those except the one against Alex with the Luris lock. Um, yeah. So... Uro, no trample. Bad card. Just gets blocked by things. And no, then it's actually with Luris. worse than Colossal Dreadmaw. <laughs> I mean, Uro in that situation, good. kind of. <laughs> Uro was good. Uh, Urza Saga was also good. I was going to say, because these cards, I think... And I was making fun of you in the draft, and yeah. obviously I've lost all you know all cred here. All of my trolling is just uh, purely burned off in the ether. I think his deck is a little bit unfocused in a way that I, as the cube designer, am like, I kind of hope this doesn't work for Parker. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Because he did I, say that because I t- I kind of don't want you to be able to just jam like a highly color devoted card like Uro, but you really want to be able to generate green, green, blue, blue alongside Urza Saga, which is a colorless land that also then sacrifices itself, which means you're one land down from using all that mana. Alongside Deathrite Shaman, which is a card that is going to take cards from your graveyard that you otherwise would want to use for Uro, that, you know... Oh. Deathrite Shaman wasn't... It was partly there for Grave Hate. Like, I mean, I know oh, it does I'm all sure, the stuff. I'm sure it's largely there for Grave Hate, but yeah. But, yeah, Grave Hate was another choke point in this format, I think. Like, I hope that this Roto Draft will mean that if I add Scrabbling Claws, which I've wanted to do for a while, people will actually I'll put it in I'll play the heck out of that. Yeah. I'll tutor it with Urza Saga. Um, and then I think we ended up, honestly, is... Like you mentioned, your best starts were when you're able to accelerate into a big threat. I think mm-hmm. you're basically the green ramp deck, yeah. And you just happen to have a bunch of cards across a bunch of colors because you took fixing pretty highly and yeah. uh, ended up with a bunch of different threats. But I do think the best starts your deck has is just like either, like I even said in, in the video, I was like, I don't think this is like your retrofitter foundry deck. The card's good. There'll be mm-hmm. games where it'll work, but like against me, you tutored it up and never activated it because you always have better things to do with your mana. Yeah. Which is what I think will often be the case in like a proactive deck like this where. Retrofitter is great. I love that card. It can be totally oppressive in the right matchup, but also it's never the most efficient thing to do with your mana if you have other options in a cube like this. Yeah, I think that's I think that's right. And there were games where I didn't have options and like it was good. Yeah. Um. Yeah. Against Scott. <laughs> Scott I, laughing I in pain. <laughs> killed Scott with a surprise <laughs> servo, which grew my Urza's or like my Karn Strucks from my Saga. Uh huh. Anyways, um. Exploration. That's yeah, another card I want to mention. I want to know exploration. I want to know about life from alone. These are the two I cards think I care most about. A little bit busted. Um, I love hearing this. I love hearing this. I almost had a turn two Nissa against you. Like, yeah, I removed one thing that kept you from having you, it. Right? You had the interaction, um, and I don't think because you had what land mana dork, and then next turn you were going to have land land Nissa. Yeah, basically. Yeah, which was like terrifying. I had no idea that exploration could do that when I picked it. Um, I think here's what I want it to be. I want it to be in many decks, like kind of just like an arboreal grazer, right? Yeah. Like it's just a ramp card that if you get it on turn one, it's kind of the same as Turns a mana dork. Fine. You go down yeah. a card, right? Because it itself does not produce mana. Yeah. So I, I recognize that you go down a card, but this environment I think is a lot about tempo. And so mm-hmm. I think if you're able to play a big threat a turn early, it's worth going down a card a lot of times to do that. And then at the end game or in the sort of mid game, have this like big synergy payoff where if you do have life from a loam or something like that, you can really go dummy with exploration. And it sounds yeah. like it kind of was that for you. Yes. There were a couple games where I had exploration in play cast life from the loam and just, it was trivial to win after that. Like, yeah, I mean, never missing a land drop ever again and hitting two a turn is a yeah. pretty good way to overwhelm your opponent. Pretty it was quickly. nuts. Um, and I think it synergizes well with the like horizon lands in your cube, mm-hmm. which people, um, maybe properly rate but they don't pick highly partly like it's a it's a painful mana base but i picked three of them and never lacked for ways to get lands in my graveyard to trigger joel rail twice you main decked all three uh yeah nice 
Um, and I think I might like them too much because I take a lot of damage from my lands. Um, but it was very good with Exploration and Life from the Loam and Joel Rail, who was the other, like she was kind of the sideways plane of the deck. It seems like a pretty suboptimal Joel Rail deck too. I missed the Horizon Lands admittedly when I looked at your list. Yeah. I was like, if you, I didn't look at the land slot, but I was like, you I was have not Sensei's happy. top, which is really good with Jarrell. You could just cat every turn for yeah. one mana. Really yeah. good. And you also have Uro, which like if you're attacking with Uro every turn, do you really need a cat as well? I mean, it's, it's nice, I guess, but uh, you're probably you'll already... You'll take a cat. You'll take a cat. If it's on offer. But besides that, there's very few other ways to like consistently draw a second card. I did miss the three Horizon Lands and the Life from Alone. Which... I was not happy when you took, I think it was Tireless Tracker. Yeah. Um, that was part of my plan. And then... There's another, there's some other card that I was sad to miss, but I, I agree. I didn't quite get there on almost all of my plans, but it seemed like there was enough overlap that I, it was okay. I yeah. Guess. I mean, your deck really worked out. You had a great record. Yeah. Uh, you beat me. And I think RIP. most importantly, I had graveyard hate. I had ways to gain life, mostly Uro and death, right? But like, and that's why I want these. Like I also had, I had scavenging use and lightning helix in my deck to gain yeah. life. And I love having that amount of life gain, where it's like mm -hmm. a little bit of way to bolster you. I had the way I had Green Suns to go get Scavenging Ooze, and it was key in a lot of matchups to just like, I mean, I lost a lot of my games, so whatever. But it was still really important, uh, both as Grave Hate and life gain, to be able to just like go get it, gain a few life. Uh, you know, I think that's right. the amount of life gain I want to happen here. Oh, I also had Courser of Crew Fix. Right. Um, Which is really, I think, more of a way to like offset the life loss than it is life gain in your deck. It's that's like, right. It's yeah. also very good with Exploration. Very good with Exploration and Life from the Loam. Yeah. Um, and Top. Yeah. So, yeah. anyways, it w I think it managed to like fill some of the choke points in your format, um, which are ways to win a late game, um, life gain, and grave hate. So, um, yeah, I really enjoyed it. Well, as a cube designer, I'm thrilled that Life from Alone and Exploration worked out for you. As the other player that wanted them, I wish they had absolutely been awful for you and you had regretted every pick you ever made. Um, yeah. But... I'll, I'll take one win, you know? Instead, uh, now you have to deal with me drafting these for the rest of time in your cube. I mean, that's great. And I hope that people listening in our play group will also do the same. I want these cards to see some play. Do it. Anthony! Oh, hey, how's it going? Come out and play, yay! Uh-oh. <laughs> <laughs> so, my draft, uh, I was in the eighth seat, and I've actually never been in this position before. Uh, because of the way the draft works, we snake back and forth. This means I get to take two cards in a row. I also have full information about what everyone else has taken, so I was kind of excited to be in this position for the first time. And I'm going to be honest, before my picks, I did not look at the sheet. I was like, I'm just going to wait, and then I'm going to I'm gonna eat all of my, my dessert all at once. As in, you like didn't look at the picks after two of them had been made. You just waited till all seven were made. Right. And so then I just looked at it for the first time. Figure out what I was going to do. Uh, so what I observed was we already had Lurus, Ragavan, Lightning Bolt, Renin Six, Snapcaster Mage, Merktide, Regent, Regent, uh, Deathrite Shaman had already been taken. So there weren't a ton of options left, which, you know, sometimes too much choice is not great, not what you want. So I'm, I'm kind of okay with that. The obvious paths were going white or green. No one had taken a green card. Except uh, for Parker and I, who both had taken a green uh, card. Uh, exactly. Um <laughs> Black was also a potential option, except with Luris and Deathrite Shaman. I wasn't really sure where people were going to go with those, but maybe they were, would end up in black. Um, and I, so, I do think Deathrite Shaman is actually more of a black card than a green card. I don't I really so, want to start It's much more black novel in, in black. It's more novel, and also the black activation, I think, is way more relevant than the green activation. Okay, sure. Draining your opponent by exiling an instant or sorcery, I think, comes up way more often than gaining life by exiling a creature. But here's the thing. Who, who wants to start on black in this cube? Like, what are the mono-black threats... Like Okay, okay, Lurus like and Deathrite Shaman, yeah. but aren't those aren't really mono black. But like, well, I mean, no, if you, no one's ever playing mono black in this cube. I know, but I'm saying like there are no black cards you can pick that make people not want to pick Thoughtsies. up black as a secondary color. Yeah. Like, is that true of other colors? Like, are yeah. there other colors you think you can box people out completely by taking a card? It's funny because I think the color it's most true of blue. is maybe white, and yet blue and white, and Anthony, yet. and yet. So, blue and white, yeah. Snapcaster and Murktide were gone, and I didn't really want to go into blue. Yeah, that's fair. Um, okay. Yeah. 
carry on. Sorry. So uh, it seemed like the two most obvious options for me were to either go mono white or mono green. I just honestly, this is where the tiebreaker of what you said, Parker, of just like, what do I actually want to play a bunch of matches with? And I looked at the green cards and was just like, I don't want to repeat of the last rotisserie draft where I had a threat light deck that was just really easily answered by a little bit of targeted removal. I really tried to just sort of I wanted to go the Justin Parnell route of lots of like proactive but somewhat interchangeable cards, so I'm like pretty every safe match. in the draft and then win every <laughs> match, exactly. Um, so that was kind of my strategy. I decided to go to the white deck because that just seemed like something I was going to enjoy more. I didn't really want to participate in the land rush, so I was pretty happy to try a I monocolored... I was jealous that you got to skip the yeah, land rush. Uh, drafting a monocolored... It was my first monocolored rotisserie draft. Uh, that felt pretty good. The other part of my strategy was I did try and bounce around in terms of taking different types of cards, so jumping around in different sort of mana values and removal versus threats because I've also been in the situation where it's like I don't take a certain kind of effect and then somebody hate drafts every single rabble master in one row because they can and that's pretty frustrating so i wanted to make sure i felt like i was building towards a cohesive deck at every point in the draft another thing that worked pretty well for me was that i did end up getting a bunch of lands that no one else really wanted so i got you know muta vault and uh mishra's factory as well as a couple of those horizon lands which i really enjoy and i think they they bolster a proactive deck like this giving it some options and i even got ancient tomb like what like 28th pick or something ridiculous and that's another card that i like is ancient tomb good in this cube anymore i just don't know it's it's insane isn't it uh but ah! also, also a lot of other people are playing a ton of shock lands which make it more well, difficult so i think it, yeah. it works in a proactive deck the and reason you got all those colorless lands me. is just because we ended up with one two three four five literally every other player except for scott or except for zach rather is in a three color deck Right, yeah. Which I think was just a matter of like us kind of boxing each other's lanes out and us feeling we had to move into a third color halfway through the draft, right? Which is a funny chain reaction. And yeah. also there were unclaimed lands, which were kind of free. Like, were there? Selesnia. Well, yeah. I took, I got those. Well, that's why you were able to jump in, right? Like, I mean, kind of. You took the windswept teeth, but like those are fetch lands. Who cares? You know, like... Bring, breeding pool were just sitting yeah, around. Yeah, breeding pools were free. No one was playing blue green. Watery so. graves didn't go for a really long time, and I had planned to take those. But well, you know, like whatever. Um, they were just sitting around, and yeah. so like. But the that meant that free. like everybody's mana base, we couldn't fit colorless lands in. Right. right. Sorry right. to interrupt. Go ahead. No, no. no. Uh, so yeah, I mean, I think that unlike a strategy like yours, where. Uh, Unlike a strategy like yours, Andy, where you I'm not were... not editing this one. I know, I know. But also, I'm, I'm realizing I'm saying... I'm just, like, pointing at people in the room, which you can't... You! Hear. Pronoun! You over there, pronoun. Um, where individual picks could really harm your strategy. You really wanted life from the loam. I knew that I was just going to take a certain amount of loss of... Yeah, I really want the best spot removal, but I'm probably going to end up with the second or third because I just, you know... I'm not going to get everything I want, but it's not going to harm my strategy too much. And that's really what I tried to take from... Justin's strategy of drafting the regular cube in a rotisserie draft of, yeah, I mean, it's not going to be perfect, but I'm going to have pieces that fit together and work. It was, I took a bigger hit than I expected because then a bunch of other people did jump into white. Literally no one had taken any, I guess Luris is the one white card that had been taken in the first row. Uh, and then, you know, Steve looked at the ELO of cards and took some white cards. <laughs> yeah, uh, I think... We said this a little bit at the uh, on the last episode when we were talking to Ryan. There's two episodes ago now. I can't keep track. It was the last episode? I don't know. I don't we, have my notes in front of me, so... We were talking knows? about forcing, and we were talking about how you were forcing Mono White in this Roto draft, and I mentioned briefly that, like, my first inclination was, like, Anthony's clearly forcing Mono White, which I figured out by, like, pick four, but at that point, Loris was gone, Mother of Runes was gone, mm -hmm. and Giver of Runes was gone, and sort of Tapashers was gone, and I'm like... Is this going to work? Is Anthony going to get a functional deck? And I think your deck's really good. Thank you. Zach yeah. thinks it's the best deck at the table. He's the best player at the table, so he's probably right. If only it had a better pilot. <laughs> uh, so, I'm so far, I've I only played two matches, and I am 0-2, but they, they were close games. Yeah. Um, and two hard matches, I think. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I think you have some better matchups. Anyway. Yeah, I guess I should actually say, so my picks were Esper Sentinel and Adeline, which I, again, just really wanted to broadcast uh, that that's what I was going to do, and then Skull Clamp, Stone Forge. A big part of my strategy also ended up being, you know, artifact based and having Stone Forge to tutor both the Skull Clamp, which I did usually get, but also having the option to get Glimmer Lens or uh, Lion, Sash. Lion Sash with it to give me some flexibility and a little bit of a toolbox against graveyard strategies, or, you know, if I'm just ahead on board and can uh, swing, swing in with the Glimmer Lens. The biggest reason I wish you had played more matches by now is I want to test my theory, which is that I think if you played more matches, 
my thesis is that you will more often get Glimmer Lens or Lion Sash and Skull Clamp in your deck. It's possible. Maybe the problem was I just drew Glimmer Lens and, and uh, Lion I mean, Sash a I, bunch. I could be wrong, but I, I've been in a similar spot where, like, I have Skull Clamp. I know in my brain Skull Clamp is a broken uh -huh. card. They shouldn't have printed this. It's messed up. But then so often it's like in this cube, there's so much removal running around. It's hard to stick a threat. And just getting uh, equipment with Stoneforge Mystic that's another threat uh, is often so much better than getting a Skull Clamp, which is pretty conditional. I mean, that's almost why I got Skull Clamp a lot, because I'm a big fan of just putting Skull Clamp on a 2 2 and attacking oh, yeah. with it. That's, like, that's great if you have a 2 2 to attack with. Right, right. What time is your training specifically? 12 time. Okay, we got plenty of time. We're good. Um, cool. I'm looking forward to our match. I'm mm -hmm. going to make you play it so I can have all the matches recorded. Absolutely. I can maybe try and salvage a 3 4. We'll see. I don't know. <laughs> we'll see what happens. <laughs> Feeling bad about it. Uh, yeah, I guess you don't have that many flyers, which is my main concern at this point. Right. So. I've only got a couple. Got Cave of the, the Frost other, Dragon. The other big question that could have been there for me is, I mean, maybe I should have looked at the list more. Is there like a similar strategy in Mono Green that isn't just a ramp deck? Can I play just like a really proactive low to the ground green deck? Or could I have participated in the land rush a little bit and splash some green as well for like, in particular things like a Seekus Chariot, I think would have been nice top end to have here. Um, but I, I didn't go that route, so... I don't think... I think there definitely is a more, like, proactive green deck. I don't think it's mono green. Mm -hmm. uh, you can be very heavily green, but I think what you really want with that deck is, like, a green Sun Zenith package, Collected Company, and some of the best, like, mm -hmm. three drops across multiple colors. The white three drops are insane to hit off Collected Company. A right. lot of the gold three drops are insane. You can Coco into, like, Leovold. Like, that's that stuff can get pretty nuts. Um, so, I think if you wanted to commit to the proactive strategy, this is the one to commit to. Mm -hmm. You... Arguably could have also drafted mono red just as successfully, potentially. There were more players in red Two by the time... people had already taken that. I mean, that was the biggest thing that just influenced yeah. where I was at, was what people had already taken. But the way it broke down, it just, like, there ended up being as many white drafters as red drafters, which yeah. I think is probably how it's mostly going to shake out by turn, by pick six of a row draft like this. Like, if a color's not being drafted, people are going to move into it. Uh, so, yeah, and then no one was on the really aggressive red cards. But I said that you probably could have had an almost equally successful deck that way. Though I think you drafted mono red, if you drafted this cube, like, a year ago. Yes. And you... Did not have a good time, and we're like, this I is awful. I yeah. And part of it was, again, like, I drafted in a way that made me vul very vulnerable to hate drafting. Yeah, I think we talked about a uh, detail there during that Roto draft, which is that I think, in some ways, the really consistent decks like your aggro deck here and a mono red aggro deck, they don't get that much better when you Roto draft. Roto draft decks, pound for pound, are a lot better than regular draft decks because it's all face up. You get lots of information, you get lots of options. And I think the decks that have just a lot of redundancy and uh, a lot of consistency have a lower ceiling and so mm -hmm. when you get to take all yeah, the best cards this deck was a highly consistent one two it's gonna it's gonna one two <laughs> oh i don't know about that uh but i think that is a, a feature of roto draft yeah. it's just that if you can have the best synergies like parker's deck or you can have the perfect control deck like zax do you really want to be playing you know a redundant one drop aggro deck uh, in the face of some of those really synergistic things and i think your deck came out really great and it really i think shows me how deep white is in this mm -hmm. cube which i felt because i've Tried to find some cuts for white in the cube recently, and just been like, ah, I love all these cards. I can't yeah. get any of them. So, do you want to do you want to talk about dismembering me with uh, Prismari command, Scott? Was that good for you? No, I oh. feel pretty bad. <laughs> oh, don't feel bad. We all came here to beat each other up. That's the point of Magic. Match game three, you were really just like, I, this is an unwinnable game. You know, after yeah. turn three, and then uh, what happened? Uh, Prismari command <laughs> happened, okay. I guess. Yeah, um, being able to shatter your lion sack. Well, it it was a ponder. That was uh, the fetch land that I desperately needed to actually start hitting land drops again. Mm -hmm. Unholy Heat and Prismari Command. And you had Hopeful Initiate, Lion Sash, Selfless Spirit, and... Um, I had a the, bunch of stuff. The, the, Maybe the three ones that Hallow discard... Blade? Yeah, Season Hallow Blade. Yeah. And I was like, I'm, I'm so... All these things are good against removal. <laughs> yeah, I'm really in trouble. Um, but then I was able to... Stick a big, big dragon. Yeah. Murktide after all of that, basically. Yeah. Murktide was in hand, so... Card is so good. Yeah. Yeah. Great card. Yeah, every time you kept you started delving cards out of your graveyard, I was like, please be Treasure Cruise. <laughs> <laughs> please just draw three cards. That's a crazy yeah. thing Anything to say. Anything but a big vanilla creature, a big French vanilla creature is all I want. Reader, it was absolutely that. <laughs> all right, uh, let's wrap up so we can play some Smashport. We have to get Scott to the train oh, station. Yeah. Uh, any final thoughts that people want to get in before the episode closes? I need to be more aggressive with Force of Will especially against the Deathrite Shaman. And Urza Saga is a house. And Parker's really great at magic, as is everybody. Other closing thoughts. Closing I thoughts. agree. It was a great weekend. I'm glad that SCG Con Baltimore Which we didn't go happened to. so that all our friends <laughs> came to town and then we hosted them and did not 
go to Ugh. that event. So thank you, Star a, City I Games. do wish that they hadn't scheduled it for pre-release weekend. This is like, I hated missing a pre-release. Although they have pre-releases happening at the event. Which... I get it, but like then you're like counter-programming against all the yeah. local yeah, game stores. Uh, I, I think overall they do pretty good about that. Yeah. The fact that every once in a while there's some scheduling conflicts, it's going to happen. I mean, there's like a pre-release every three weeks now, yeah. so it's hard to keep up. Also true. Parker, closing thoughts. Um, closing had a great gloats. time. I enjoyed playing Life from the Loam against you and yeah thanks for I having us I wastelanded him twice when he cast Life from the Loam oh yeah was like, <laughs> it was, oh no it was really oh, good oh that's great mm-hmm. I mean these videos are all just a long string of like I don't want to say bad beats because it wasn't unlucky it was like my opponents like drafted and you know chose cards for their deck that would good have this beats. outcome it was a long string of like my opponents doing the executing their plan against me <laughs> <laughs> and me oh. being like ha you did a good job soldiering through I was really tired too, but yeah, what are you going to yeah. do? All right, cool. That's it for this episode Scott, of Like Paper Radio. Do we do, do you have any? Yeah, he said he's just closing thoughts. He's closing thoughts. Scott says thank you off microphone. Yes. Thank you. You're so welcome. Thank you for coming to town. It's always great to see you guys. Yes. Uh, the Lord of the Rings surveys are out on the website. Fill them yes. out so that uh, we can do a, a thing at some point about the cards, maybe. Uh, surveys, they're linked. And uh, that's the end of this episode of Lucky Paper Radio. Thank you for tuning in. Uh, big thanks to Anthony and Scott and Parker and Steve who had run for this special guest episode. All of our music is produced by DJ James Nasty. All the magic cards are produced by Wizards of the Coast. The show is produced by all of us thinking really hard about magic, doing a big road draft, and speaking to microphones about it. Let's go play some Smash Boys. Woo! 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 Woo!